Lecture 33 is wrapping up a lot of the things that we've learned about integration. We briefly touched on volumes and flow rates at the end of Lecture 32. I'll continue talking about that and related to the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll go to projectile motion. In this case, motion uh, with just gravity acting or air resistance. And on Monday, I'll show you what happens when you include air resistance. You should understand the big ideas of those things, though the details, as far as the formulas, is, it gets too messy. Okay? So you want, the thing you want to focus on is the main ideas, graphically, numerically. The formulas, especially for the distance traveled, get really messy, though. 33B will include more projectile motion and also one last application, data modeling with density functions, cumulative distribution functions, and how that's related to integration. So let's start by going back to Mathematica and looking at the flows. So the word flow is kind of a generic term that can mean, you know, water is moving through pipes or uh, coming into a pool or something like that or, or going out of a pool. Um, it could be talking about laminar flow, which is nice smooth flow, or turbulent flow. Really, we're talking in a simpler situation here about flow rates and volume. We've got some tank that is filling up or going down in volume over time. And we can think about this in terms of calculus. Okay, so again, don't focus so much on the colors other than just to relate the color to the graph. The blue is the volume. That's how the amount of water in the tank. And the blue graph is the volume. Volume is a function of time and whatever units you want to use. Liters, gallons, whatever. Setting time to be minutes. The red graph is the flow rate. It can be positive or negative. The red water, so to speak, is going out initially, and you can see I made this kind of thick here because it's going out at a high rate, right? If I make it thinner as time goes by, then it's not going out at such a fast rate there. And then when the red graph is positive, that means water's coming in. And when the red graph is highest, in here, water's coming in at a high rate. If the units of the volume are, say, liters, then the units of the rate, the flow rate, would be liters per minute. I'm starting time not at zero, but at negative three, effectively. <coughs> Letting time go by, we see how these things are related to each other. Thinking about the graphs, the red graph, the flow rate, is the derivative of the blue graph. I don't know if you've noticed it. I try to do that consistently, make the red the derivative of the blue. The red graph tells you the slope of the blue graph at any moment in time. The rate of change of the amount of water in the tank with respect to time. At time equals effectively negative three at the start here, the rate of change of volume with respect to flat time is negative five, say liters per minute. At that instant in time, the volume is going down at that rate, five liters per every minute. If it kept going down at the constant rate of five liters per minute, after one minute, it would have five fewer liters. But it doesn't go down at the constant rate. As time increases toward negative two, it's not going out so fast anymore. The flow rate is closer to negative one liter per minute here. At time equals wherever that intercept is, right about there, about negative 2.2 or so for t, the flow rate is zero. At that instant in time, the rate of change of volume is zero. The slope of the blue graph is zero. It's got a horizontal tangent in a local min. You can use the first or second derivative test to verify it's a local min. Let's review the first and second derivative test just verbally and graphically here. That would be a critical point of the blue graph. Slope of the blue graph is zero. The derivative of it is zero. And the derivative changes sign from negative to positive as you pass through that critical point. The slope of the blue graph changes from negative to positive. It's got to be a local minute. It makes intuitive sense. The graph has to look like that. 
I don't have a graph of the second derivative here, but the second derivative is the derivative of the derivative. It's the slope of the red graph, which is positive right there. This graph's concave up right there. It's got to be a min at that critical. Likewise, if I move a little further, I get to a local max, right about here or so. First derivative test. This is a critical point. Tangent is horizontal. The derivative is zero. The derivative changes from positive to negative. The slope blue graph, blue graph changes from positive to negative. It's got to be a little close. <coughs> Likewise, the second derivative of the blue graph, which is the derivative of the red graph, is negative. The red graph slope is negative, so the blue graph has to be concave down there. It's a local max. Okay, so you should be able to do problems where you use the first or second derivative test. But you should also understand it in terms of pictures. And in terms of integration, the blue is an antiderivative of the red, but also the change in the value of the blue is equal to the definite integral of the red. Let's write that as an equation on the board here. The total change in volume. And I do want to focus on the change in the volume here, not the volume itself. The change in volume would be the same as the volume if the volume starts out at zero, just like the change in position is the same as the position if the position starts out at zero. Though you can't really have negative volume where you can have negative position. The integral gives you the change in volume over whatever time interval you're interested in. Let's say from t equals a to t equals b. To find that change in volume, integrate its rate of change. If the volume is, uh, I'll call it capital of t actually, then this is going to be capital F prime of t. Integrate its rate of change from A to B. And if you imagine this as a summation of infinitesimals, it makes intuitive sense. What we've got here is a rate of change of the volume with respect to time, say in liters per minute. Imagine that as being multiplied times dt, an infinitesimally small amount of time in minutes. The minutes would cancel, and the product would have units of liters. And you could even call it uh, dv. You could call this dv, an infinitesimally small change in volume, which could be positive or negative, depending on whether f prime is positive or negative. If you imagine the integral is <laughs> adding, you're saying to get the total change in volume, add up the little changes in volume. What could be more natural? It's almost as if the FTC is obvious. What do you think about it? That's no proof, OK? The rigorous proof of the FTC is hard. We're not going to do it. Calc 2 probably will do it. If you take Calc 2 for me, at least an outline of the proof. But again, think about it intuitively. To find the total change in volume, delta V, over some actual finite interval, add up the infinitesimally small changes in B over infinitesimally small changes in time. This is essentially, this is like distance equals rate times time, except it's volume equals rate times time. The units for integrals are always the units of the function you're integrating, called the integrand, times the units of the variable, the independent variable, t. In this case, liters per minute times minutes, which results in liters. I'm going to assign a few problems where you think about units over the weekend um, that are not this exact type of problem. And you can still figure out the answers for the units because you can just multiply the units for the function itself here, for this derivative, times the units for the variable. Actually, sometimes the function will not be labeled as a derivative. It could be the derivative of some function, but it won't necessarily be labeled that way. 
if I call the derivative, I mean, I call little f of t, then this is more consistent with the notation of the fundamental theorem of calculus if I write this as this. And this then would be like the capital F of B minus capital F of A. So this is illustrating the idea of the fundamental theorem of calculus. And hopefully it makes intuitive sense that way. However, the way you usually use it in most simple problems, most problems, not necessarily simple, is the other way. Instead of saying I want to find the change in volume by integrating the rate of change, you're saying I've got a function I want to integrate, how do I integrate? How do I find the value? How do I find the actual signed area? And we are talking the signed area for this example because the graph goes, the red graph goes both above and below the axis. So areas below the axis and above the curve are counted negatively toward the integral. In a simple problem, I guess this is a simple problem, integrate, say, from negative 1 to 2, t squared dt. This could be a problem on exam 3, for the final exam. That's your f of t. <coughs> How do I find the integral? Think backwards here. I need to find the capital F and do this difference. I need to find an antiderivative. Doesn't matter what antiderivative you pick. The plus C is irrelevant. I mentioned that last time. You might as well let C be zero. This is T squared. Find an antiderivative. Call it, say, capital F. Through a little trial and error, it's going to involve T cubed and that's going to involve a one-third in front if I want that to differentiate to that. Because if I differentiate, this three comes down and cancels with the one-third to give me a one, so to speak, in front of the t squared. You should be able to guess that, that kind of thing. So this is going to be capital F of two minus capital F of negative one. People often write this kind of notation. They put the antiderivative here and they put like either a line or maybe a bracket or something like that here. I usually just make a line. And put the limits of integration down here and here. And that's the notation that means do this. Plug in the top number and subtract what you, what you get when you plug in the bottom number. That's capital F of 2 minus capital F of negative 1. And for this problem, this simplifies to 8 thirds plus 1 third, right? You get two minus signs canceling there. Negative 1 cubed is negative 1, because it's negative 1 times negative 1 times negative 1, times 1 third, times negative 1 third, or times 1 third is one, negative 1 third. So I'd be subtracting negative 1 third, which means I'm adding 1 third. The answer is 3. In Mathematica, you can do this. <coughs> you can use the writing assistant here, for example. You can put an integral sign in here. Click on the button there. Okay, negative 1, 3, or 2, t squared dt. The answer is 3. You can also do it without the palette, by the way, or the writing system. You could also just do integrate t squared, comma t goes from negative 1 to 2 inside curvy braces like that and get the answer. When you do integrate, mathematics tries to do it symbolically. Not all integrals are possible to do symbolically, but they're always possible to do approximately with Riemann sums. I'm not going to talk about Riemann sums today, but I will talk about them on Monday. So if it doesn't work because it's just too hard, 
and integrate will do an approximation. That's not necessary here, but it's always possible to do. Though even for well, some really wild functions, like our infinitely oscillating ones, probably any integrate fails as well. Some functions are just too weird to deal with sometimes. Okay. Can I clarify anything that I said there? By the way, property of integrals that I haven't mentioned yet, but I, I told you to read about, is that uh, a couple different things here. If I integrate the sum of two functions, say t squared plus t cubed, that's going to be the same as the sum of the integrals of each function individually. So that'll be the same as the integral from negative 1 to 2 of t squared plus the integral from negative 1 to 2 of t cubed. Add those two separate integrals, you get the same final answer. Any separate forms. That's an example of a linearity property of integrals. Remember, a linearity property of derivatives was that the derivative of a sum is the sum of derivatives, or in general, the derivative of a linear combination, c f of x plus d g of x, is the corresponding linear combination of the derivatives, c f prime of x plus d g prime of x. A similar kind of linearity holds with integrals. Integrate c f of x plus d g of x is the corresponding linear combination of the integrals of those functions. So the derivative operator is linear, and the integral operator is linear. One other property right up here is that if you integrate a function from a to b, and let's say c is now some number between a and b, though it actually doesn't have to be between a and b, you can break this integral up into pieces. First integrate from a to c, then integrate from c to b. And that should make intuitive sense if you think about a picture and imagine your graph to be above the axis, axis here. What that equation is saying is that to find the total area under the graph from a to b, you can break it up as the sum of two, two smaller areas, the integral from a to c plus the integral from c to b. That's what that equation effectively says in this situation. Those are a couple fundamental properties you should, should know for exam three as well. <coughs> and you'll see some sample problems in the old exams where, I, where you're asked to deal with things like that. All right, let's go to projectile motion. Today, it's projectile motion only thinking about gravity, no air resistance. And again, the formulas get super complicated especially for the distance traveled. So don't focus so much on the formulas themselves, more the idea. And there are going to be vectors in these pictures here as well. And again, I'm not testing you on vectors, but I think it's good to introduce them, especially if you need to take more math and physics so that you are aware of how they are useful. So a projectile is fired out of the launcher at a 30 degree angle from the horizontal and with an initial speed of 500 meters per second which is faster than the speed of sound, by the way, I looked it up. This is like 1,100 um, something miles per hour. Model the motion of the projectile with parametric equations. You should realize that if you're going to do this in the most simple way, you should assume that the mouth of the launcher is at ground level and put the origin at the mouth of the launcher as well. Now, of course, I made it look like a cannon. Um, it could be above ground level. And if it were, you'd have to make adjustments. Like, then I guess the x-axis would no longer be the ground then. The ground would be down here at x at y equals negative whatever. But just for simplicity, let's pretend this is right at ground level 
we're ultimately interested in like when does it hit the ground, how high does it go, that kind of thing. This arrow is its initial velocity vector. It's approximately 433 i hat plus 250 j hat. I figured that out with trigonometry using the fact that this is a 30 degree angle. And the length of this vector is 500. 433 is 250 times square root of 3. This horizontal vector is actually about 433 i hat. i hat is a unit vector of length 1 in the horizontal direction. Scale it up by 433 and you get a vector about this long. This vector right here is 250 j hat. j hat is a vector with length 1 pointing straight up. Scale it up by that one, you get this vector. The initial velocity is the sum of those two components, we say. And it is the initial velocity vector, it's not the path. The projectile does not go straight, right? It's under the influence of gravity. Right as it, after it comes out of the launcher, it's going to start curving like a parabola. With there's, when there's no air resistance, the motion is along the parabola. So how do you find the parametric equations? You should understand the basic idea here. This is simple enough that you should understand this. And maybe you'll be able to do it on the test. There's no air resistance. That means the horizontal velocity is going to stay constant. I mean, the object is, projectile is going like this. There's a horizontal component to its velocity that stays at a constant velocity. That's the 433, actually. 433 meters per second. That would be f of d. That would be the x-coordinate of the projectile as a function. <coughs> no slowing down because no air resistance. Vertically, though, it's a bit more complicated because you do have to take gravity into account. Otherwise, what, what will you be doing if you're not taking gravity into account? You're not modeling projectile in the Earth's atmosphere if you're not. So the y-coordinate has to follow the same quadratic law that we've seen for any straight up and down motion. Negative 1 half gt squared plus the initial velocity, upward velocity, times t, plus the initial height, which is 0. There's no initial height there, right, because it's 0. Or I should say there is an initial height there, but it is zero. So you don't have to write. G, of course, is about 9.8. It's not exactly 9.8, by the way. It's approximate. And by the way, if you go to the top of the mountain, G is no longer 9.8. It's smaller. I knew that. That's true. The acceleration due to gravity is actually not constant. What? Did my physics teacher lie to me? It's an approximate it's an approximation. It's approximately constant near the surface of the Earth. Okay. This is true when t is between 0 and b, where b is some unknown time when it hits the ground. I might want to figure out what b is. Yeah, that's not too hard to do. Set g of t equal to 0, solve for g. And you want the positive. And this is a fairly easy one to solve. You factor out of t. Uh, this is going to be 0 when t is 0, or when this is 0. We want the positive root, that's going to be our b, 250 over 4.9. You do not need the quadratic formula here if you've got no constant term. If we had a non-zero height there initially, then we'd have to use the quadratic formula, or factor it if we were lucky. So it's going to take about 51 seconds to hit the ground again. I'm ignoring the curvature of the Earth. <laughs> Flat ground, right? Ignoring the curvature of the Earth. Technically speaking, if you, especially if it's going to travel really far, which it will here, I mean, it's in the air for 51 seconds, it's going horizontally 433 meters per second. Imagine over four football ball fields long every second. It's going pretty far. Technically, you probably should take the curvature of the Earth into account. How far will the projectile travel horizontally? What is its horizontal range? Is the way this question is often phrased. Just plug in B into what? What do you think? To find the horizontal distance travel. Into G? What happens if you plug B into G?
B is the time when it hits the ground. G is the vertical position. G and B is zero. You gotta plug it into F. F is the horizontal position. Turns out to be 22,092 meters, about 22 kilometers. Wow. How far is that? We're in Arden Hills, Minnesota. Many tech, many, downtown Minneapolis, 22 kilometers away? I, I don't think so. I think it's closer. By the bird, how the bird flies. Uh, it might be 10 to 15 kilometers. Probably you have to go like to Bloomington or maybe even down to Burnsville to go for 22 kilometers. Okay. Let's continue. Let's talk about vectors. Again, not because I'm testing you on it, but just for your own information. For future applications, if you're in physics, a lot, whether you're a physics major or engineering major or not. That's called the position vector, often labeled R of t. It's f of t times i hat plus g of t times j hat. Why? at an arbitrary time, the projectile is at some point whose coordinates are f of t comma g of t. The position vector you want to draw starting at the origin and pointing to that point at that time, like we saw in the animation on Wednesday, this vector down here is going to be f of t times i hat, and this vector right here, this right triangle, that's going to be g of t times j hat. That's why that's the position vector. Take its derivative to find velocity vector. That means take the derivative, derivatives of f and g, f prime and g prime, and put them next to the i hat and j hat. And these things are functions of t. These arrows change as time goes by. And it turns out the velocity vector points in the direction of instantaneous velocity, the direction of motion, at any moment of time. And it has a length equal to the speed by the Pythagorean theorem, which I'll show you in a second. The acceleration vector is the derivative of the velocity vector. It's this, and hey, isn't that interesting? Negative 9.8 j hat is what it simplifies to. A constant acceleration, straight down. A vector pointing straight down with a length of 9.8. Cool. It matches what, how gravity acts when you ignore other forces. The speed is the length of the velocity vector. Use the Pythagorean theorem on the velocity vector. So the speed is going to be the square root of f prime squared plus g prime squared. We've seen this formula before. You should know this is the formula for the speed and be able to use it plug numbers in for t, be able to graph it, be able to maximize it or minimize it, probably by taking uh, the derivative of its square so you can avoid square roots, as we talked about. Then find the max or min value by plugging the critical point or maybe the endpoints over some closed interval into the speed function, like we did on Wednesday. Turns out to simplify that, how about the distance traveled? It's the integral of the speed. You gotta integrate this thing. Ugh, yikes. This is why the formula for the distance is nasty. Could I integrate that? I think I could, but I might be likely to make a mistake. I think I know the technique. But I did put it in mathematics ultimately. We could try to figure out the distance traveled by doing an indefinite integral. Just a pure antiderivative, but put a plus c. But you'd have to figure out what c is so the speed of zero. Oops, that's a typo. Distance zero is zero. Oh, I don't want to. I don't want to fix that typo quite yet. In fact, I won't fix it until after class. I didn't want to preview the shock that I'm about to show you. This is supposed to be distance zero equals zero. At time zero, you have to travel any distance. We could do it, do it as a definite mineral. 
What would B as a definite integral? We've seen this before. Here would be that. There's your starting time. Time zero is my starting time this time. There's my arbitrary upper limit of integration that I want to think of as being the variable for the distance travel function. I need to integrate the speed. I need to find the area under the speed graph. And it will be a, an area under, not a signed area between, because the speed will never be negative. I had math now, I could do it. Here it is, in all its glory. <laughs> wow, yikes. Or kind of cool, yay technology. I don't want to figure, I won't do this by myself. I mean, if I had to, I think I could. My life depended on it. I know the technique it was used, but I don't, want, I don't want to do that by myself. Yay, technology. You can do this in Mathematica. Again, Wolfram Alpha, Wolfram Research makes Mathematica. So if you go to Wolfram Alpha, you can see it can do this as well. And you can, Wolfram Alpha does artificial intelligence, natural machine learning language stuff. So if that makes sense. So you can probably just type integrate square root this, and maybe it will know what to do. Wow! Oh, wait a minute. What is this function? Is that H a typo? No, it's not a typo, actually. This is inverse cinch or arc cinch. Cinch. I haven't talked about hyperbolic functions in class, but I did have you read about it if you kept up with your reading. Hyperbolic function, cinch, is actually an exponential function or a, a, a linear combination of exponential functions. It's this. So inverse cinch is its inverse function, which is actually going to involve logarithms. This is a, a logarithm in disguise. Because you have to solve, if you set this equal to y, to find its inverse function, you have to solve for x. So just quickly mentioning how to do it. You, um, I think you'd want to uh, multiply everything by e to the x, and also maybe 2. And then you want to write that as a quadratic in e to the x. And use the quadratic formula to find e to the x. And then take a logarithm to find x. And that would be inverse cinch. Amazingly, cinch and cosh act a lot like sine and cosine. Somewhat mysteriously. The relationship between them reaches its full beauty in all its glory if you learn about complex numbers and complex functions. With the imaginary unit, the square root of negative one. It's really amazing. Maybe I'll show you some pictures next week. Better take a break.